Falcons of Bowties are sometimes cool with myself, Ashley and Ed. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ash. How's things this lovely Friday evening? Very good, thank you. I've got my coffee here, albeit decaf, don't worry, and it's in my mug, the living legend. We've also joined by the third bow tie, James. Good evening, James. Hello, chaps. How are we doing? Not bad at all, not bad at all. Now, I just have lemonade, but it is in a TARDIS glass, if that helps. So. Well, you say it's lemonade, but I can't see any bubbles. Now, we do tend to have a Doctor Who theme going on here and James Bond and so on and the writers. So we've got a special guest this evening, a very special guest. James, who would that be? Well, our very, very special guest today is the uh, the one and only and incomparable Lizzie Hopley. Hello, Lizzie. Hello. I'm very, very fond of this word, incomparable. I'm going to attach that to my name by deed poll, I feel, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid. We're really, really chuffed that, um, that, that, that you, you've agreed to come on and have a chat with us, Lizzie. It's really kind of you to spare the time. Um, yeah, I know Ed, Ed in particular, uh, we said we, we've, got to, we've got to ask Lizzie, we've got to ask Lizzie else. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's, let's, uh, let's enjoy, enjoy this time together. So if it's all right with you, I would like to just give a bit of an intro about your background um, and the kind of work you've done in the past. I'll ask you a few um, questions about your um, your acting and writing career and some of the work you've done and then um, the gorgeous Ed will pick up with some very uh, specifically uh, big finish aimed questions if that sits right with your good self. Absolutely, fire away. Perfect, well Lizzie, um, listeners if you don't already know Lizzie's an award-winning writer, actress and producer across multiple genres um, from God's own corner of the world in the northwest of England. Um, born in Liverpool, studied at Manchester University before heading to RADA. Um, Lizzie earned the first on screen credit uh, back in 1998 in The Things You Do for Love, uh, Black Butterflies. And to quote a phrase, hasn't looked back since. Uh, so, some of the things you may have seen uh, Lizzie in uh, include uh, Jane Eyre, Called Midwife, Luther, Holby City. Uh, Time, uh, season one of Time with uh, Sean Bean, Stephen Graham, The Crown, uh, Brassic, and many, many more. So, Lizzie, uh, all throughout that time, uh, you have written and acted across uh, multiple um, genres and media. You're experienced in in pitching your own ideas, developing them, writing them, acting in them, producing them in some cases. So, when you were first getting into this world, did you at any point envisage yourself? as one thing or the other, specialising in any of these creative avenues. Um, and do you, do you ever, even now, look at yourself and think, I am more this than that? It's an excellent question. And I, I think I oscillate between writing and acting. And can I, I can see the seeds of that when I was very, very young. Um, I used to act along with films on videos. And um, some people would be singing along in their hairbrush to songs. I did that as well, badly. But it was mostly I would I would act along with, um, with films. And I would get the soundtracks from films as well. But you could get the ones with the text as well, with the lines, like early Indiana Jones on tape. Or I had a, a record of the the black hole and I'd act along with them and kind of do my own scenes and pretend I was all these characters so that was a little an early indication you know when I was at 10 11 that I was doing that but I was I would also be writing my own stories um as soon as I could hold a pen I was an avid reader and funnily enough read the target books um and I used to make notes from all my favorite target books I was addicted to going to the library and getting I, I think you were allowed six books. So on the seventh day, I got really annoyed because it was a Sunday and I, the library was shut. So <laughs> I was like, no, no, what do I do? So I used to stay up all night and read a whole book. Um, but yeah, I had a little notepad and I would make little notes of lines that I liked or particularly clever things the doctor would say, usually or almost always Tom Baker, um, just because his turn of phrase was so funny. And yeah, so that was an attraction to writerly lines, I think. And then I started writing my own sci-fi novel, which um, was horrendous. <laughs> I stand by it. And I actually used one of the plots of them in a Doctor Who not that long ago. So I was quite proud of that. Uh, yeah, so I've always been both. And I know, 
you mentioned other things as well. I, I, I wouldn't call myself a, a, a brilliant producer. I think that's another skill in itself. But sometimes you have to make your own work. Um, but it's definitely actor, writer. I think it's harder in this country to put the two together. I hope that's changing. Certainly in Europe and America, we, we're used to actors doing more than one thing. Um, I hope that's changing here. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I hope so too, because um, I think there's a lot of people out there who are very skilled in both, and it will be um, it will be well. It is a shame to see opportunities wasted to uh, to develop those things. So thank thank you for that. And interesting as well that Doctor Who seems to have been part of your life for a long, long time. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so. I mean, even subdividing that, if we can. Uh, sorry, I was just watching The Apprentice with uh, with my wife, so things like subdividing and analysis and all that is, is rocketing through my head at the moment. I'll, <laughs> I'll try and avoid any Alan Sugar witticisms. Um, but even looking at that at acting in itself, it's not just the TV, the screen work that you've um, you hugely experienced in. Uh, you, you've, you've got a very long-lasting love of, of the theatre and stage work. Um, again, I believe you uh, first met Conrad on the stage several years back. Um, you're an associate learning practitioner with the Royal Shakespeare Company, I believe, uh, and you've delivered workshops, continued to deliver workshops in several countries uh, and online, uh, in addition to tutorials that you deliver with the uh, British American uh, Drama Academy. Uh, you've also been very heavily involved in designing, delivering academic courses, um, Guildford and Oxford. Um, so it's fair to say theatre is something you've loved for a long time uh, and, and love being part of. I'm guessing it must be a tremendous feeling to help them instill that love, um, that, that love of the, of, of the medium in, in new generations as well. Oh, that's a lovely question. Thank you for that, James. Um, I think I, I came to love Shakespeare in particular at school because I had a brilliant teacher and I, since I was little, I always wanted to be at the RSC in the Globe. And the RSC, when I did a season there, I discovered their education department that's run by an actress I um, was in a cast with in, when I first left RADA, uh, Jackie O'Hanlon. I acted with her and she's now running the whole the entire education department, the RSC. And she's just featured, the, she's all over social media at the moment, the RSC have posted a new um, independent report by their education department on the link between Shakespeare and literacy and children developing English. And that is now proven by this independent report and study led by Jackie, um, which is extraordinary when you hear things like Birmingham City Council's um, mess up and losing so much money, going bankrupt and cutting their arts, and they're not alone. So it, it is something I'm really passionate about. I think if I hadn't had the bug for acting and writing, I would have loved to have gone into education because educational reform is, is, is so important. But my love of Shakespeare, I've been very, very lucky to have kind of developed and continued that. And I, was, I didn't really have a professional development course when I was at RADA, which, which basically means they taught me loads of things, but not how to survive in the profession. That's changed. They now do. But when I was there a million years ago, it didn't exist. People didn't really need those skills. And those skills have been changing massively in terms of social media and how actors now have to have a massive Instagram following in order to get work a lot of the time. So how to survive as actors um, was something I also was very passionate about because I'd had to do it myself. And uh, it took a long time before I started earning enough money as a writer to to fill the gaps. So I didn't have to take other work, um, which I had to do for years and years. And I'm lucky that I have two professions that are now providing me with a, a dual career. It took a long, long time for that to happen. So designing a course in professional development at Guildford and then being able to take workshops all around the world it kind of fulfills a, a, a double role for me in that I'm helping actors stay in the profession they love and and get better because I'm passing on skills that I've learned in in my career and also bringing young minds um that perhaps are learning Shakespeare in, in not necessarily the wrong way but in an academic way 
um, when it was written to be performed. So as soon as you can make that practical, and I've seen it work in China, I've seen it work in New York, I've seen it work in Birmingham, and I've seen it work all over the place. Now, I've taken workshops, and I've learned how to do that through the RSC. And I now also do a course, or I, I help with a course um, for postgrads at Oxford University every year. Um, so my love of Shakespeare is just kind of expanded. Now I write for the RSC education department regularly. I write activities for the classroom and that never seems to end. I'm part of their new Shakespeare curriculum and it's something I'm really proud of. And I'm really proud to announce that I've just got a season at the Globe Theatre. So I'm doing filming at the moment and following that I will be treading the board the Shakespearean oak at uh, at the Globe this summer, so I'm I couldn't be happier right now. Absolute congratulations! That's fantastic. Thank news. you. Well done. I mean, it, you, your love for it is is obvious, and, and yeah, in a very very small way. I remember again thousands of years ago when I was at school, um, something very similar. We had an English teacher, and uh, we were good in a lot of ways, but we were reading Shakespeare. I think it was Hamlet and. You know, we were really struggling with it, really struggling with it. And then the next year, we were doing Romeo and Juliet, and that teacher got us all up in front of the class and said, "You're not going to come and recite and do your um, and read out passages. You're all going to come out and you're going to act it for me." <laughs> and it was amazing. It was wow. a completely different way of of, of learning. You know, it wasn't the drama That's class. Brilliant. It was, it was you will learn Shakespeare by you're going to act this out and you're going to feel. You know, by saying it out loud, you you can read it out loud, or you can get into the character. And and were yeah. you terrified? Oh God, God, yeah, terrified. Oh, you, In those yeah, days, I, I used to be terrified. far more confident, so I, I used to enjoy acting. And um, now, I, my God, couldn't do it now. But it, it, yeah, it was it was a, a really clever way of teaching, um, and mm. it got us all interested. And then, yeah, from from there, we all began to appreciate Shakespeare in a way we probably didn't before. So, That's see, you know, hearing you know the, the the work you've you've been doing in that is 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 really lovely, and I'm delighted for you personally. You know, you're going to be on the globe. That's tremendous. Oh, I know it's going to be really fun. Um, but yeah, you can't force people to love Shakespeare in the way you do. You have to get what you're given. And sometimes I've had a gang of thirteen year old girls, all taller than me, come in and go, "We ain't doing this today. We're we're not interested." And you kind of go, "All right, do you want to do some stage fighting?" So they they learn how to bitch slap each other, and and you teach them how to do that by using the two sisters scene in Taming of the Shrew, and the next minute they're acting Shakespeare, but they yeah. access it through, you know, slapping the hell out of each other or mm. pretending they are, and learning that skill as well, and thinking, "Oh, this is cool," so that you they leave knowing a little something and feeling they own it. So it's mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing, you know, that I think is really important. Absolutely, that's that that's really interesting. So thank, thank you for, for for talking about that. Um, and you, you take it a little bit further. You know, some of the differences between um, the kind of acting you know, you've described there, the, and, and particularly stage acting and screen acting. Um, I suppose in some ways the differences between those two genres, are, are, those mediums, sorry, are, are obvious. Uh, you're on the stage; it's all one take. You know, it goes wrong. You got to soldier on, make the best of it, and and plow through. Uh, there's the buzz, um, the adrenaline rush of having the, the live audience there uh, that makes it feel, I suppose, a, a unique experience. Whereas on TV, multiple takes, different camera angles um, and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm interested in you know your own experiences of the differences between the two. Uh, but but also you know, my own personal question on the back of that is I've always wondered what's, what's the difference, if any, between you know, a, a company of actors on the stage doing the same show night after night uh, and being part of a TV cast or or, or um, you know a film crew or film cast, um, and you know, you're together again for a long time, but maybe not in the same quite the same way. Are the dynamics different in that environment? That's so interesting. Because a lot of people ask the difference. Would it? What's it like, stage and screen? You know, what do you prefer? This is an entirely different question. No one's asked me that before. They um, and it's so so important. A lot of plays rehearse as an ensemble, so they keep the cast together. I think most directors now have, have realised that if you do split people up too much, then you get such a discrepancy between people who are just coming in and out, and they don't feel part of the whole ensemble. And the audience can tell the play loses a bit of energy as a result. Um, 
so the trend now is to have most people most of the time in the rehearsal room and it does create that ensemble feel and you do feel like a bit of an army going to not to war but you know you're going into this delightful battle um that is live and and you're consequently risking something each time so that's that's great and you can build up relationships with people in a in a, in a play that you don't necessarily have scenes with and that's really very interesting because it never used to be the case sometimes it was very much an us and them um and I could segue on to first meeting Conrad because that was very much a, I, I will save it though but that was very much an example of I was being on tour and so therefore mixing all together as, as a cast. Um, obviously filming is very, very different. And funnily enough, I'm in the middle of a big project at the moment um, where I've got a quite a major role in a TV series and therefore was there right at the beginning when um, we had the read throughs of every single episode. There were five episodes in this, in this series. Um, yeah no eight episodes in one series that's it five series are planned so it is this monstrous thing and I'm in the, in the first series and you get together and we read through every single episode so I got to know who everyone was and then most of these people I've not seen since I come in and I'm either on my own in front of the camera or I'm with one other person for example I had a son in this series on one day I did all my scenes with him and then I, I'm not going to see him again until one of the final days of filming, which is a completely different part of the story. So it is quite odd. You suddenly realise, oh, gosh, I've, I've only got one scene with you and then you're gone. And I, you're, you've got your own journey through this thing. So filming is different again. And also you can come in and just be a day player, as I've done plenty of those, you know, like for Luther, so you come in, you do one or two days and you know nobody. And you're hoping to God that people are friendly with you and, and are nice to you. Um, but usually you have no interaction whatsoever with the leads or you have a tiny interaction with them and you learn you have this very intense moment and then you never see them again. So it's very odd. You have to protect yourself a little bit because you can feel a little bit discarded or spend the whole day in your trailer and not mix. Um Whereas I'm lucky in this, I feel I'm, I'm getting to know a lot more people. But you do bond with the crew. That's a different thing. In theatre, yes, you do as well, but you don't see as many of them. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're in the lighting box or the, you know, the sound desk or whatever, so you don't always see them every day and spend a lot of time with them. Um, but I absolutely love being on a film set because you get to know everybody, the sound people who are putting wires up your blouse, the people who are lighting your face, the runners who are bringing you your valuable cups of tea and you know that becomes a family because you are constantly solving problems together they create your scene and then you're slotted in at the very last moment and you can't mess it up because you're costing everyone money and time and, and time is money so you come in and you have to be so focused and just go beep and do your thing and if it goes wrong yes you do another take but very often you have to be brilliant every time because what does go wrong is the plane goes over or something goes off in the background or something happens it can't be you <laughs> it is sometimes but that pressure it's a different kind of live mm. pressure and it's a technical challenge in a very different way and I I love that because you don't have your audience but you are aware of your camera mm. and that kind of becomes the eye of the people you're going to be telling the story to yeah that's right i mean from, from that point of view you, you you're never not being watched are you you're, you're like like you say you, it's not you've got rows and rows yeah. of people all looking in one direction at you on the film set they're all around you and you are the center of an awful lot of people's attention um exactly uh, <laughs> yeah who are paying money for you to stand there and, and do it that's that's i'm also yeah really interested when you say you, you have to guard yourself um you know emotionally personally to, to a degree when you're in these situations that's a lot of times uh, i suppose any kind of creative doesn't really get the credit for that kind of resilience you have to have 
because uh, there's so oh, many occasions no. where you're you're writing pitches on a, again, on a much lower level when I'm pitching ideas and you mm. get that initial interest and they go, this is great. And then six weeks later, no, it's rubbish and we'll never talk to you again. And you go, you go from up there to, oh, right, okay. Um, oh, there's so many scenarios. I mean, you're asking, uh, yeah, you're asking me mm. just about acting. We haven't even got on to writing. And um, you, you must all know yourselves as creative people. Rejection is a part of the world we live in. And someone said to me a while ago, most people only have two or three job interviews in their life. We have them as an actor. I have them constantly. Every audition is a job interview. Every pitch you send is a potential job interview. At least with writing, it's like you get criticism about your child, which is awful and you want to kill people about it. But with acting, it people are criticizing you. Every rejection is is a rejection and, and dealing with that but even when you have a job I remember the first acting job I had I was so happy and I bonded with all these people and it was a wonderful experience and then the job ended and everyone moved on and you're like oh, oh, you know where are all these friends that I thought I had that's a strange thing mm, you know you yeah. have the, the, you, and you forge really close relationships with people because you're either in intimate scenes or you know as actors you have to kind of get friendly with people get warm with people be able to uh, to work and trust people very quickly so you have to kind of open yourself up and and just be just be very present and less guarded I suppose than you are with you know in the normal environment work environment and then suddenly that that's over and I found the older members of the cast dealt with that better they were prepared to go on and I could see them closing the job before they left and I was still very much mm. in it without a job to go to so that's hard you know when people are talking about their next work and their next thing that they're going off to do and you're like I'm going back to to the stuck shelves or mm. sell people phones you know it it, it, it is a, a big thing yeah my word absolutely um but never want to shy away from a challenge uh lizzie you also um took on a, a whole extra layer of emotional pressure uh back in 2017 <laughs> um quite famous you, you had a very popular uh, blog at the time um when you took a year out to do um stand-up comedy for uh for your blog uh diary of a stand-up virgin and again, a whole different kind of performance, a different dynamic, different energy, different expectations from the people coming to see you. Um, tell us a little bit about that. But also, is there a part of you that continually wants to push and challenge yourself in new directions? Well, clearly, there's a part of me that's mad. Um, I think we can accept that uh, of self-flagellating um, punishment that I give myself. Um that was just a friend of mine just got sick of me moaning about comedians and how whenever we went to see comedy live, I'd be wanting to do it. And she just said, why don't you just put your money where your mouth is and do it for a year, write a blog about it. Then you've got an end product and, and see what it's like. And I went, all right. <laughs> and it just so happened, we had no idea that lockdown was going to happen, although it was a good few years later. Um, so I know a lot of comedians that I was working with in that year had a bit of a staggered entry to the profession. But gosh, I learned a lot because I tried stand up comedy when I left university in Manchester and it was the right time to do it. Because you had Steve Coogan, who was huge, and Carolina Hearn, who hadn't reached telly yet, but she was on the circuit doing Sister Mary Immaculate and Mrs. Merton. And, and she was so uh, the clubs were just I think it was is it Jason um Manford was just starting off as as well when he was very very young and it was the right era to be doing it but I was so scared and I thought it would be like that forever the the, the fear that I felt for those first couple of gigs was so debilitating I thought I'd never get over that and so I stopped and also I wanted to be an actor so I, I wanted to get to London and have an agent and do serious acting and that got in the way but yeah I've always I suppose I still slightly wish that I'd had a parallel life to have gone into that because so many comedians now it's such a huge deal comedy has gone mental and so many comics have been able to write 
do their own work, create their own series. Um, it's not a given, but it is a way into comedy on telly and also then drama for a lot of comedians. They can make that little step. And as an audience, we love nothing more than to see a funny person being really serious. Like when Lenny Henry was in Broadchurch and we're all like, ooh, he can act. And I, I was in Long Song with him out in um, Dominican Republic and he played this this slave. And, and, and you just think, wow, who would have thought? And then when we see a serious person doing comedy as well and branching out into that, you just think, oh, this is a gift. Um, so, yeah, it would have been a really brilliant career move to have done, gone into comedy. But, and the thing I learned very quickly in 2017 was the, the more you go on stage, the less the nerves affect you. And very quickly, they still come back, but very quickly they become part of what you do and they're not as debilitating, they're just a thing. Um, and I think it was Rosie Jones said recently in an interview, I think it was with the, the Times, that it, it used to be a big thing for her, the state, the, the nerves, but actually now she looks forward to them and she enjoys the, that adrenaline rush. And that that's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I could have learned that earlier, but it was, it was a fantastic experience. And now I fear nothing. You know, I went on stage as Thatcher just before the um, lockdown and I was in the wings. I remember about to make my entrance and I felt the poisoning of adrenaline. I mean, you feel it. I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, before a sport or anything like that, where you know something's going to happen and could go wrong. This wave of poison, which is adrenaline. And I just thought, this it's horrible. Uh, what are you scared of? You've died on your ass on stage in front of the pipe industry guild as a comedian where a room full of men in bath thought you were shit so i <laughs> sorry if i'm not allowed to swear on your pod just have um Bye -bye. but yeah <laughs> thanks but yeah you think nothing can be worse than that and i didn't die so you walk on stage and you go yeah i can do thatcher and i don't care <laughs> <laughs> yeah um hear everything you're saying there about um but about the, the nerves of the comedy performance and, and something you eventually get get used to. You've you've, you've written comedy. You've done. You've you've written a sitcom pilot. I think you you were nominated for uh, for an award for some of your, your, your comedy writing as well. Um, and I suppose I'm going to ask you that awkward question again. Of naturally speaking, if you were forced to choose, do you want to write comedy? Do you want to perform comedy? What's what's better for you? Oh, I'd want to perform it. I want to do both. I think. Um... And you know, I, I I have I have done it, and I know it. It's so much fun to make people laugh. Is the best thing. It's the best thing. Um, so yeah, but I have learned in a long, arduous career of writing that sometimes you have to stand away in order for things to get made. Um, there are other people who can make that happen quicker than you, and you have to be able to stand back and go actually. I'm perhaps not the best person for this. Um, and to learn to still write funny things for other people and other characters. And sometimes characters write themselves as funny. I mean, I know we're getting on to Big Finish in a bit, but I wrote um, for Shades of Fear, another Ninth Doctor um, thing. There was this one set in a charity shop and it kind of wrote itself. It was a really weird one. And as I was writing it, it just wrote itself like, a comedy and will these characters start to be funny and then one of them developed um frank skinner's voice and so i asked if he could be cast in it because i just thought i'm writing for frank skinner an older frank skinner but it's very strange I, I mean, when you're writing sometimes things just go i'm not serious i am a comedy or you'll try and do the opposite and it'll suddenly go i'm not funny i'm going to be serious now and you're like all right yeah <laughs> so <laughs> you obey the the voices Oh, yes. You very much have to obey the voices. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask one more question because I know Eddie's chomping at the bit there. And I thank you for your patience, <laughs> Edward. Um, so as, as, as I pointed out loads of times, um, and you, you've talked about you, um, you, you're skilled in multiple areas. You, you, you write across several genres. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like Watch of a Duck's Back, really. So um, as well as the comedies, as well as the sci-fi, which... Um, a lot of our listeners will, will will know and love you for you've done social commentary pieces, um, 
all in different fields, uh, audio work, screen work, theatre work. I remember a, a lovely conversation you had with uh, with Lisa McMullen, who's another wonderful writer um, uh, for, for, for Big Finish in particular, and, and a lot of TV work as well. Um, and in, the one comment that, that stuck in my mind was you were talking about the, uh, you were talking specifically about Big Finish, but the freedom that working in audio uh, gives you in terms of the other scope of your of, of your scripts, the scopes of, of the stories where you know, you might be restrained uh, for budget reasons or, or production value reasons in other areas. Um, so, so more generally, I think when you are sitting down, when you have a story idea, and particularly when you're talking about a particular message you might want to give or particular commentary you might you might want to give, do you sit down, write the story, and then decide later? This would be a good audio. This would be a good play. This would be suitable for TV. Or do you sit down anytime and say, "I'm going to write a play, uh, and it's going to be about this"? Does how how I suppose it's how much does the message of what you're trying to say tell you? Like those voices again. How, how much does that message tell mm. you where it's going to be and where it's best going to fit? Oh, again, another brilliant, brilliant question. And um, some stories will let you know that just by their very nature you'll go gosh this feels epic so it needs to be perhaps a novel um, and I've still I'm yet to, to answer those voices and write them I've written one but that hasn't gone anywhere um, so you know what it's going to be but it it is very much industry led and practicality led you know sometimes people will ask you to pitch for certain things so you'll have to reach into your bag of tricks and existing stories and go can I turn this into a, an audio drama or can I turn this into a tv series whereas I've written this as a film and that happens all the time all the time um so and again there's a cynical side of things which is what's more likely to get made you know, it, it, it's. I'd love to write a great big telly sitcom or a comedy series, but the one I won the prize for with Positive Productions was was for radio, and and we're still pushing that because people are so nervous of taking steps in certain directions. Um, so, it, you know, it it's and and again, you can have fabulous sweeping ideas. You know, I've, I've written. A film script about Mary Anning Fossil Hunter, which I absolutely adore, and I it was the first film script I ever wrote, first screenplay I ever wrote, and I was constantly told how expensive it was going to be because I had so many scenes set at night, and you're like, oh right, <laughs> so when you come to audio, that's not an option, you know that that's not an issue. I mean, it, you can have anything set anywhere and do anything you like. So there is an, a whopping great freedom that comes with audio, whereas everything else, you're constantly going, oh, I need to actually, does that need to be set in a car? Can it just be in a room? Because you're thinking of budget and immediately you add another character, you're, you, you, you're costing production money. So all of these things suddenly come into play. And But you're right, James, sometimes you'll have an idea and you'll go, right, this is this is a a play it would look really beautiful in in the theater um but it depends what people want and what they'll give you money for <laughs> she said cynically i've got my pet projects and i will keep pushing my pet projects um but very often it's a case of i have to i have to take a job that's gonna get me paid <laughs> yes understood please do keep pushing um <laughs> Thank you so much for your time from, from my side. I'm going to hand over to Matt for some big finish chat. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, James. And again, thank you massively, Lizzie, for coming on and talking to us. Um, so as James said, um, James has covered your career without big finish. I'm just going to go on really to talk to you about your prolific and incredible career and output you have for for big finish audio. So really, um, when I was researching this, I realised that, um, I didn't realise at the time, I, I apologise for that, that you'd done a lot of work as an actor for Big Finish before becoming one of their, one of, if not, not the best writer that they've got working for them at the moment. But how did that transition from actor to writer happen within the same company? That's, it's really interesting. And it's down to Gary Russell, I think, and, um, and um, Joe Lidster. You know, I, I was pushing, I suppose, well, I didn't even push myself as a writer. I was just getting so many interesting things. Um, 
And I know they were looking for more female writers, uh, but I was given a stint on Dark Shadows. And it was a world I knew nothing about. And I know Joe was running it. He was the showrunner for it. And he, he wanted new writers and he coached me in the world and the characters. And I listened to loads of it. And it was just, it just seemed, I mean, I'm used to absorbing worlds from nowhere, you know, uh, and, and going along with them and, and just suddenly learning massive things about certain characters I knew nothing about. And you like do a little bit of an open university degree in an area of big finish um, before you then start a new box set or something like that. Because uh, I'm by no means a Conrad or a Gary because they're encyclopedias on Big Finish and on Doctor Who. Um, a fan as I am, I don't have their knowledge. Um, so coming to Dark Shadows, was I was a complete newbie and I was, I'd played Ivanka Romano and I was offered some work kind of writing for her as well. And it was, it was, it was really interesting because I'd written for radio before. I'd had some good successes with Radio 4 and Radio 3. Um, that was my first commission as a, as a professional writer for Radio 4. Um, so, yeah, this was something new again, where I was kind of coached by a brilliant writer himself, Joe Lidster, in a different genre and a, a different mood and how to write gothic, you know, and, and it just added another string to my bow because as a writer, you learn... Um, that genre and mood and tone are, you know, diff just different animals. You learn to write in each one. And some people specialise in those ones and they never move from them. And that's fantastic. And they kind of get, get into crime or the or noir or whatever it is. Um, I'm far too interested in too many things to get stuck in one. But that was my first foray. And then um, wrote Carrying Queen, which is one of my favourite big finishes, which was the Dark Shadows one. And... Of course, then I was very much trying to write parts of myself <laughs> so I could be in them as well as acting them. So I'm like, this is an opportunity I'm not giving up. I'm, I can write, so I'm going to write a really good part for myself. Um, and that's how it all began, really. It was a while before they trusted me with an actual Doctor Who. But, uh, yeah. So you started off you know, with, with Dark Shadows. I, I think Ooh. I died... Back in the day, I think I did probably listen to all the Dark Shadows monthly range. Um, um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Never seen the TV show, but the, the audio was absolutely fantastic. Um, but you start off with Dark Shadows, but now you've been really, really prolific and you've pretty much contributed as a writer to every range that Big Finish do. Um, just thinking, when you're pitching a story, do you pitch the story in its raw form um, and then it gets sort of adapted to fit um, a range or do you pitch it for a particular range or particular character um it, it's sometimes a mixture ed it it's um you're usually approached by a producer or an editor that's got a box set in mind and either they will have um a, a story shell or an i vague idea um i remember you know the there are some that you get, such as Time Lord Victorious, where it was very much, um, this is how it starts, this is how it ends, it's die hard on a Dalek ship, go. And I filled in all the rest, which was one of my, you know, again, one of my favourite scripts. Other times, you'll pitch a few ideas for, for a specific doctor, and then someone will remember of specific idea this is how um the iron shore came about for uh third doctor where i pitched something set in liverpool docks about this creature that lived in the dock and um matt and nick had remembered that and said actually could we could we adapt that so it's not on earth not in liverpool but very much use that story for the doctor and joe um and and it yeah, it can very much be like that. Sometimes you send them three or four ideas and they just go that one. <laughs> um, so it really is, you know, and, and stories can go through lots of different variations. Like Precious Annihilation was um, supposed to be uh, an audio novel, a novella, and then suddenly we got um, um, 
we got more actors available because of lockdown. And so we could actually use David Tennant and he was immediate. So we went, right, let's write the script. Can you do it by tomorrow afternoon? I went, I guess. And so things are like forced by opportunity, which is a nice way of putting it. I mean. And you just touched on um, a story that's meant to be a novella then. I'm going to go on to one that is actually an audio novel um, that if there's released quite recently to coincide with the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Uh, you an audio novel uh, called Box of Terrors, it's with featuring the, the third and fourth Doctors and two different versions of Sarah Jane, narrated by John Coleshaw. Um, is it a different experience writing an audio novel to an audio drama, and how does that work? How does how does it work for you? Um, it's massively different, especially this one, because I had turned another script into an audio novel. There was a Martha adventure where, where we just didn't have Freema anymore, so it, it had to get um, it had to turn into something else. But that was only a ten thousand word affair. This was going to be a six parter, so it's sixty thousand words, and I hadn't written that much apart from a novel I'd written ages ago. I hadn't actually written that much prose. So it was a huge undertaking and I was so excited. And it was a massive thing for David Richardson to ask me to do, but I was given a wonderful um, editor, Roland Moore, and he really held my hand through it and gave me a lot of confidence. And of course, the wonderful idea from um, from John, John Coleshaw and David, you know, said, this is what we want. Can you do it? And I had to come up with a, with a plot. And it, it's really like, the only way I can describe it is that the spine of every story is like a living thing, you know, the actual spine of a creature. And the length of it is dependent on how long your project is. You know, I, I've written for half hour shows. I've written then for, I got to know the shape of a 45 minute radio for afternoon play. That was a certain thing I was used to. I'm that now very used to an hour length. You know, you've got 90 minutes to 120 minutes for a screenplay. So you get used to your three act or five acts however you work however which way you work structure wise to kind of sit on this skeleton and that's how it lives in my mind of course I had this much larger beast in mind now for the the 60,000 word audio novel um and it was in the six sections and I knew that there were strands going all the way through it and I, to be honest at the beginning I thought it was going to be one of the hardest things I'd ever done because I was also working abroad as well. I was in, um, I was doing RSC workshops abroad. So I was off doing that in the days and trying to come up with the, the plot. But I always front load the work. I plan, 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 get those treatments working, get the plot working in short form before I script anything. I know some writers work differently. Some, um, the wonderful um, um, John Dorney sits down and starts writing scripts. Uh, uh, he can just do that. Not always, not exclusively, but he can just start a script in the next minute he's finished it. And it's a work of genius. I tend to, I, I, I don't trust my brain to stay on target, stay on target, stay on target. I don't trust myself. Ooh, Star Wars weapon. Um, but yeah, I would, I would spin off and explode on the Death Star somewhere. I think if I was to just let myself free wheel with my, um, with my delivery so I, t I tend to try and get that treatment as tight as possible and then cut it down into acts and scenes and then start writing it um so structurally how that that's how that one came about but I was just so excited that I was able to do it because it means that I can do more things like that and I, I was thrilled by the end result obviously it was a sum of parts much greater than me involving John and the whole sound design and everything. Brilliant. Fantastic. Amazing. Um, James before has alluded, I mean, you've spoken to James about your um, absolute love of Shakespeare and the world of Shakespeare and the world of Doctor Who seem to collide in your ninth Doctor story, um, The Curse of Lady Macbeth. And apart from, uh, you know, the obvious bard himself, what was the inspiration behind it? And what did it mean to you to win the Scribe Award for it? Oh, um, this was a, a really fun one because it was my chance to write for Chris Freckleston. And I, I knew that at that point he was 
quite new to saying yes to it all and wanted to handpick the stories. So I knew that there were more people pitching than would actually get the gig. So I thought, right, I'm going to get the gig. And what's he going to be interested in? And he'd just done Macbeth at the RSC. And as it happened, I had been to the Edinburgh Festival and seen a lecture by some amazing bloke on the real Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And I'd learned a few things. I'd learned that they were a brilliant couple. They basically took in children from the village who didn't have parents. So they kind of ran an orphanage that Duncan was young and a bit of a bastard and that, you know, nothing was quite how it seemed. You know, they, they were far more heroic. Than, than Shakespeare had obviously taken this little story, which he did often, and created something very different with it. And so Lady Macbeth was synonymous with evil. And um, um, I was interested in the real characters. And I thought, all right, he's either going to be sick of Macbeth because he's just done it at the RSC and not want to go anywhere near it, or he'll go, ooh, because as an actor, you immerse yourself in in a character and in a play, and this was a completely different take on it. So I thought, I'm appealing to the actor brain that he may well be interested in that different side of that story. So pitching that, especially from the, the woman's perspective, um, I thought he might go for it, and he did, yay! So that was my in. But also I was interested in doing the research. I was really fascinated in her and the reality of the world that they were in and where this evil might have come from in such a um in in such a bloodthirsty world where uh kingship and um inheritance was a terrifying thing that no one seemed to live very long in order to pass on a crown to a to your young and so that seemed to be a very terrifying world in which to have a creature that literally was fear um, manifest. So it was, a, it was, it seemed to just come together. And sometimes you stop writing an audio, you stop writing anything, and you just think, ah, oh, this one's coming together. I can see this one. I can actually visually see it like a movie in my mind. And they're always the most successful big finish audios when you can see everything so visually, like I could with Fox of Terrors, I saw every moment of that massively visually. So I knew as I was writing it that it was going to work. Because if I can see it and transcribe that onto the page and then have everyone work on top of that, then it will make sense in the audience's mind, the listener's mind, I hope. I hope. Um, and then this, obviously that, that when you describe award, so how did that feel to be to be awarded for your creativity? Didn't expect it at all. In fact, I have it here. And I'm very proud of the fact that they've, they've got my name completely wrong. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully. So, you know, I was absolutely adamant I was going to get a physical award. So I chased them and chased them and chased them. And this came through the post and I was just like, <gasps> so excited to take it out of the velvet. And then, you know, it's got the wrong spelling on it. Um, and for a scribe award to have my name as well, I thought was very apt and um, ironic. Um, but it's it's nevertheless, I'm thrilled with it. And I'm now Elizabeth Hopley. But um, no, I, it was really unexpected. I'd forgotten they existed and I hadn't even, you know, I'd, I'd given no thought to them because if John Dorney wins them all. Um, and it, I guess people just went for the Shakespeare thing and it is, you know, I did, I did, I know the play so well. I know Macbeth inside out. It is my favourite play. Um, I've just seen Ray Fiennes do it. it. I absolutely adore that play. And uh, I think that helped as well. When you love the subject matter, it, it adds something else to the drama. So that must have come across. But yeah, finally, I, I, won the, I say finally as if it was long waited or expected or wished for, honestly hadn't even thought of it. So now everyone I write, I'm like, oh, is this, this a scribe winner? <laughs> no, I don't really. That's fantastic. It's that it's, it must be wonderful to be to, you know, to be recognised for doing something you love, which is it, it's, it's that's absolutely amazing. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the honour of ha having um, Conrad Westmas as a guest on our show, um, and you recently um, were chosen to reintroduce him to the world of Big Finish, or reintroduce the character of Cariz to the world of Big Finish um, in the Battle of Giants Causeway. Uh, how did that happen? 
Um, it happened because I wasn't chosen. I suggested it. I'm just correct. Did that just because I'm, I'm actually proud of it? It was a, a meeting we had on Zoom a few years ago when David Richardson brought up the fact we were going to write the box set for the Rutins and Santarins and we could pitch something. And I was given eighth, which I was thrilled about, and Charlie. And I'd written for them a, a, quite a lot, written for eighth quite a bit. And I just suddenly thought, this is, this is an opportunity. Can we have the full set? Can we have carers as well? And I think the first response was, do you think we'll get him? Of course, I know Conrad, and I didn't know if he'd wanted it, but I knew I could certainly ask him. Um, and I, it literally took a text, and he was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, and so that was that. And I was so, so happy. And I hope this will lead to more, because the response for having Kara's return and for Conrad to be so brilliant in it as well, um, was bigger than either of us expected and um, I think bigger than Big Finish expected as well so the love is clearly there the team works better than it that it um even we even dreamt of when we last heard from them and it it just opened up a whole new world of possibilities really an untapped life of carers because I think there's a lot to be explored there um his character always fascinated me because of course it was the first introduction to Big Finish that I had. I was cast in Terra Firma, starring Conrad Wesmer. Um, and that character fascinated me because he was so weird and there was a lot of weird stuff going on. But there was something about him that I identified with. Because um, as an actor, I'm always changing to please people and changing to you know empathise with people and you're morphing your personality all the time. So there's a side of him, that character, that I thought, well, I like that, that's interesting. I could do a lot with that. Um, so it was a long time coming, but finally we, we got him in. And I'm, I'm really, really thrilled that, that I was given that opportunity to, to suggest him. Because I think Doctor Who fans love the nostalgia. And it's bizarre now that something, you know, mm. I, can remember, I can remember the original sort of Charlie Eight and Career stories like it was yesterday. And to have a whole new generation having it as a nostalgia trip and that warmth for the character that, you know, I think, oh, it was two minutes ago and he left two minutes ago and it was actually, what, 17 oh. years ago. And the warmth you've yeah. had and the response you've had is absolutely fantastic. Conrad was pretty much saying the same. The, the response and the warmth from fans he's had for mm. his turn is brilliant. And for you, for writing him, it, it's absolutely fantastic. It was wonderful. It just started immediately when people realised. And then what was added to that were the younger fans, like the first-timers coming to this character and going... He's amazing. I never, and I think it's because we pushed this, and I won't take credit for this one because it was John Dorney that suggested he would be a great. Because I had him in some scenes with the Root and you know Queen and well not the Queen but um the, she was pretending to be um the Queen of the Celts. Um, but this relationship was going on. And he said well, that's apt because he's almost like a shapeshifter as well. He would empathise with a shapeshifter because he's got that skill and that that shielding defense mechanism of of empathy stroke disguise um and that made massive sense and as soon as we tapped into that i realized why i had been so interested in carries and that psychology that path of psychology because it is somewhere you you cling to especially when you're younger and identity is a fluid thing and and the carries is someone who seeks um his disguise is almost like a shield and somewhere where he gets lost as well and that the people don't trust him because he is this mercurial thing. He's got this side to him. And I think there are some young people who identified with that struggle and somewhere in that psychology, the difficulties that he faced in terms of, uh, of identity and, and vulnerability and being misread by people uh, and not accepted by people. And that is brilliant, you know, and you get young voices contacting Conrad and saying, oh, my God, I really, really understand carers and he's brilliant. And it helped me with this and it helped me see that. And you're like, what? You know, to, to en entertain an audience is one thing, but to actually, you know, 
connect emotionally and psychologically with people and and in a positive way that's just something you can dream of it's, it's, and that, it's, that's down to his performance as well it's not just in the writing it's mostly because it's conrad and he does it so brilliantly and he created carries so i'm literally standing on a lizardy shoulder a giant but you know shoulder. Part of the power of the creative arts to sort of just to move and connect with people um you know you, it's it's something you don't get in well you might get in, in a different way in sort of the likes of sport and whatever something like this it speaks to people on, on a on a real l- fundamental level and it words can change people's lives and the what you said there the connection and the response that conrad have had it's wonderful well thank you for saying that edward because it takes us lovely back to when i first started talking to james about and um, the rsc and trying to and shakespeare and um, changing people's um young people's lives with words and the wonderful thing that audio does is it it is a very personal experience because you are you you've got voices and sounds in your in your ear and you can either be listening to them on a run or a walk or on a train a busy train but it's personal experience you know yes we have personal experiences watching um theater of course we do and watching film and tv of course we do but there's something about having that existing in your imagination because for all my creativity as a writer and an actor in the world of audio the final creator is the listener and I have a huge respect for the listener who we write for because at the end of the day they're the one who create the world I can only suggest it through words and and hope that people will act it and the wonderful big finish team producing the sound effects and putting it all together the end of the day the listener creates the story in their mind and for every listener you know they don't have the visuals of the film they don't have the, the actors mannerisms you know they've only got their senses the audio the audio sense and so every single listener is going to have a different version of it so it is personal and you have to respect that and know that you can't lead them astray you have to really deliver and if you can incite moments like that and leave them thinking, then it, it you know, you've got a, you've got a, one of the audios that's just pit the others, you know, it's doing something special. Most, most definitely. Thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to wear my fanboy on my sleeve now. I really am. Um, recently, I had the privilege of listening to The Shadow Master. Um, it's the best piece of Doctor Who related media I have experienced since the episode It Takes You Away. Now, anyone who knows me will know It Takes You Away is in my top five Doctor Who stories of, of all time. Uh, I've even got two tattoos based on It Takes You Away, so that shows how much I love it. And this is like the best story I've heard since that. Um, can you just tell our listeners why they should experience it and how the story yeah. evolved? Well, I'm I'm thrilled you say that, Edward, because it is one of my favourites. And sometimes these um, the Master Box sets kind of are not, I wouldn't say marginalised, but they... They're not um, always as noticed, you know, unless people are already fans of Warmaster or whatever. Um, they can they can pass you by because there's so much content on Big Finish. Um, and this was a personal, I mean, I love writing for Derek Jacobi and this was one of the first, if not the first, no, it was the second one I think I was asked to do. Um, and Scott came to me and said um, that a while ago I had written a Christmas show for a theatre company in Oxford um, that had been produced and had done really well called Tales from Hands, Christian Anderson. And it was framed by the shadow because as I was researching that um, that show, I read his complete works and the shadow is a story that jumped out at me as being unlike anything I had ever read. It's very different from Grimm. It's very different from other hands, Christian Anderson tales. The shadow is is quite, quite chilling. And I won't give you too many spoilers because I want everyone to go out there immediately read it. It's really short, so read it. But it 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 the character is incredible. That a man and his shadow. But that shadow becomes um a, a being in its own right. Um and Scott had asked me, he'd noticed that it had been done and he'd asked me to send him it so he could, I, I think he was doing um, some work with students or something and he, he needed a, a stage show or something for 
um, to work on. So I gave him that and I said, yeah, play with it. So he came back to me and said, can we do something on the shadow for this box set? Um, immediately that was a yes, because of course you've got the master and what Jacobi brings to the, his master was very much in the tone and vein of that story, of that short story. It is a fairy tale with a dark side, a very, very dark side. And it was immediate fit because it, it wasn't just um, that the shadow was dark, the master was even more worse. <laughs> so, you know, you, it was taking the short story further because, you, you, yes, you were entering the, you know, um, this land of uh, fairy tales and bringing those fairy tales to life so I could bring the characters in the short story to life through the, the framework, but also the relationship between the master and the shadow master. And we had a shadow TARDIS as well, which, okay, little spoiler, but that is just to bring people in. Um, it's chilling. There are moments in this that are absolutely chilling. And it kind of turns it on its head in that the, the, the shadow being the villain in the Hans Christian Andersen story kind of discovers his own villain in in the master. And you don't know who is going to win and who's the darker out of the two. But it is it's a story about trust and betrayal and also hope. And, you know, it gives, I mean, uh, gosh, the actor playing um, Gethin Anthony, who I'd not heard before as the show, there was absolutely beauteous in this story because he's he's got such innocence and hope and that's in the hands of christian anderson as well you know this new being comes into existence and doesn't know if he's for good or or not because he doesn't know what those words mean so again it was allowing the wonderful derek jacoby to to play with this new creature uh and you know doesn't always end well <laughs> And I'll leave that there. But I'm so happy that you that you loved it as much as you do, Edward. And I hope I've described it and done it justice because what they did then with the story and how it gets so big, um, but so personal as well. Yeah, yeah thank, I love yeah. that one. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing it to life. I mean, I would just describe it as, to anyone who wants this to it, as absorbing, beautiful, cruel and devastating. That's just four words I'd use for it. And thank you very much. And that's where we'll end this, this evening's grilling, Lizzie. But thank you so, so much for coming on. You've been an absolute mm -hmm. joy and gone above and beyond what we could have expected. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you are so welcome. Yeah. I love chatting with you. And we must do it again because there's so much else we could talk about, isn't there? There's so many other people. I want to talk more about Conrad. I want to talk about more things. So, yeah, we must do it again. But I've absolutely loved doing this. I'm meeting nice, you thank properly, you. putting the faces to the voices. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank You're you, Lizzie. Thank you, Lizzie. Well, you have been absolutely fantastic, Lizzie. And you know what? We've got the two for the price of one. We even got a question off Lizzie Hopefully as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. Thank you ever so much for joining us. She won the Scribe Award, not me. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get her on at some point as well. Um, so, <laughs> she's talented. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, you've been fantastic as well. You've, your questions were brilliant. So thank you ever so much. And on that bombshell, we, we might as well say goodbye. So it's goodbye from Ashley. Goodbye from me. Cheerio from me. Goodbye. Thank you so much. <laughs>